Y2K Redux. Tune back to the year 2000 and take a stroll down Apocalypse Lane. I'm Eduardo Soto Falcón, creator and director of Y2K Redux, an audio drama series set in the year 2000. In this presentation, I'll talk about the making of this project and show you behind the scenes images as well as fragments of the first three episodes. A few years ago, I had a very detailed, mystical and vivid dream about the current world not being real, but rather an illusion created by the brain power of the survivors of a series of cataclysmic events. When I woke up, I immediately took notes and developed a story world. It took me a couple of years to write it as a movie script, which I titled The Astral Grid. In the story, the characters find out that there was an apocalypse in the year 2000 and that we've been living in a false world ever since. The script has earned a few accolades in the contest circuit, including Best Science Fiction at the 2019 Chicago Genre Screenwriting Competition. As I haven't been able to raise money yet for my movie projects, a couple of years ago I was lured into the world of audio drama as a more affordable art form to tell my stories. Audio drama is the current revival of the old radio plays that becomes more relevant and popular every day. For listeners, it's an art form that allows multitasking and more freedom of movement as well as social distancing. It also nurtures and stimulates the imagination to a higher degree. The most famous audio drama in history and an inspiration of mine since I was a teenager is The War of the Worlds, a radio broadcast directed by Orson Welles 90 years ago as a Halloween special. For my first ventures in audio drama, I adapted two of my screenplays, a short for experimentation and a feature-length story to practice as much as possible and polish skills. For my next project as series, I wanted to conceive and write something specifically for audio. As I review my script Astral Grid, I realized that a prequel set in the year 2000 would be quite interesting and compelling. I wrote the first three episodes of Y2K Redux in the spring of 2019 while I paused in between my other productions. As I wanted the show to feel very real and connect directly to the listener, I focused the point of view to a group of radio hosts as they witness and report on the events of their doomed world. Many of the scenes are set in the studios of a fictional FM and shortwave station called Tuni Radio. By the fall of 2019, audio arts festivals in the USA and UK programmed my short audio play while I tackled the post-production of my feature-length audiobook. So the timing was ideal to look for funding to produce the first three episodes of Y2K Redux. At that moment, I auditioned James Kenneth for the protagonist Luke Marlowe and attached him to the project. I also contacted composer Steve Lehman for the original music. I proposed the project to the region of Waterloo Arts Fund, which right before Christmas gracefully awarded me a grant that has made this production possible. Then the pandemic and lockdown hit Canada and the rest of the world. On the one hand, this international tragedy postponed the production for several months. And on the other hand, the subject matter became more real and current as we were living similar situations and especially a similar mood as portrayed in the first episodes of Y2K Redux. Finding the right venue was another challenge courtesy of the pandemic, but we ended gathering cast and crew at the Kitchener Waterloo Little Theatre and kept a maximum of 10 people at any given moment in the premises. The recording sessions in the theatre were a very special experience, while two or three actors performed on stage at a time for an audience of their colleagues. Now these three episodes are finished and ready to be presented to you. In addition to publishing on every major podcast provider, I will send this project to audio arts festivals around the world. The next step is to grow the audience and raise funds to produce more episodes and continue this apocalyptic reflection of an alternate year 2000. Hoping that in real life, we can all manage to have a better destiny after this challenging year 2020. Thank you and enjoy the show.
James Kenneth as Luke Marlowe. Emily Schooley as Roxy Gibson. Jeffrey Carl as Professor Kenneth Morris. Genaro Vasquez as Eligio. Philomena Sherwood as Monique Toussaint. Julie C. Shepard as Janet Malveen. Manny Baines playing the role of Dax. Matt Clark as Ezekiel. Nathaniel Azevedo as Synthetic Voice. Michael Mello as Nando. Elizabeth Bernal as the Telegraphist. Denise Gismondi as the Dispatcher. Chris Allison as the Border Guard. Ana Gabriela Quintero as the Operator. Very excited to be part of this outstanding project and very grateful to the Region of Waterloo Arts Fund for supporting independent productions. Y2K Redux. Episode 1 New Millennium's Eve. The future arrives in less than an hour. Are we ready for it? Welcome back, everyone, to our New Year's Eve show this Friday night. We're CKES Tooney Radio, broadcasting live from Toronto, Canada to the world on FM and shortwave. My name is Luke Marlowe and, well, you're stuck with me tonight, December 31st, 1999. Sorry, all the other hosts are on holiday. As we gaze into the future, it's important to look back at the past too. Tonight, I revisit 20 or so years ago when I was a kid. Back then, I dreamed about this night and more so, about the era that starts tomorrow. I used to feel terribly out of place. I didn't belong anywhere. My parents seemed almost ancient in their ways. It was like we were a time traveler's conundrum. My parents had come from the past and I'd been kidnapped from the future and we were just stuck with each other in an uncomfortable and lackluster time frame. But the year 2000 and the 21st century always gave me hope. I remember, for instance, reading about space exploration Supposedly, tonight, there was going to be a joint USA-Russia manned mission landing on Mars. I imagine myself watching those astronauts and cosmonauts walking side by side on Mars today. Hey, I even imagine being one of them. But now that we reached this state, it's not happening. All we got was that silly wheeled robot two years ago. The Sojourner. Yeah, right, Dax, that rover thing. Now the latest mission just disappeared or crashed. What was the name of that one? The Mars Polar Lander? Yeah, well, it disappeared a few weeks ago, so space exploration for the 21st century looks pretty anticlimactic so far. Hopefully it'll pick up in the following years. Who knows? Maybe finally by 2020 we'll get to see astronauts on Mars. But even so, I'm very pumped up for tonight. All these years feeling that I was living in an antiquated world, always looking forward to the world of the 21st century. Now, it's finally here. So close we can almost smell it. In fact, most of the world already lives in the year 2000, as it started 18 hours ago, somewhere in the Pacific. I think we can assume that the celebrations from Auckland to London to Buenos Aires have been outstanding. I mean, it's a once in a thousand years party. Now, unfortunately, I have been too busy today at the station, so I haven't been able to follow the festivities. How about you, Dax? How did it go in India? No idea. I've been here since 7 a.m., but I'm sure it went awesome. Now, Dax is our chief engineer. In fact, our only engineer today. I think the rest of the staff joined the technician strike going on in Quebec, or they're on holiday too. What staff are you talking about? <laughs> right. Hang in there, Dax. We're almost done with this century. You'll cash in lots of overtime. Actually, we still have one more year to go. The year 2000 is the last of the 20th century. The 21st century doesn't start until 2001. Yeah, I know, man. But tell that to the worldwide celebration. I'm pretty sure next year no one will be celebrating like this. Or who knows, maybe we'll get to enjoy two mega global parties. Either way, the year 2000 is the one that changes everything for everyone. It's the future, man. My childhood dream come true. I mean, I feel like someone should pinch me right now. Would you like Roxy to pinch you? Roxy Gibson? Man, she's awesome. People, make sure to tune into her show, New Age Grooves with Roxy, right here on CKES on Saturday mornings and Wednesday evenings. I wish she was here with us, but she's in Mexico right now. 
She's with us on the phone. Really? Ah, oh, patch her through, man. Hey, Rox. Buenas noches. Hello, Luke. How are you? How's the weather over there? Ha. <laughs> You're just being mean, Rox. You know we're way cold over here. How does it feel to trade snow for sand? Loving the Mexican beaches? Haven't been to the beach yet, Luke. Besides, this is not fully a vacation. You guys gave me a microcassette recorder and a bunch of tapes to work my butt off. Hey, it's our only chance to have a correspondent in Mexico. You can't be at the beach all day. Take a break once in a while from the sun and record a few interviews or some kind of travelogue for us. For sure. That's why tonight I'm in Teotihuacan. Is that like a ruined site? Teotihuacan is a huge archaeological complex in central Mexico, 40 kilometers away from Mexico City. It was one of the largest cities in the whole world 1,500 years ago. It's a very mysterious and mystical place, considered the top energy center in the world to receive the new millennium tonight, even more than the Great Pyramids of Giza. Representatives from every indigenous nation in the continent, from Canada to Argentina, gathered here today. The atmosphere has been incredible. It's the most mystical event one could ever witness. Sounds amazing. Tell us a bit of what you've seen so far. Mm, the most spectacular thing I saw today was Los Voladores de Papantla. It's an amazing ritual ceremony to ask for the gods' favor. Flying men come swinging down headlong from a 30-meter pole, ropes tied to their legs, while playing pre-Columbian music. Hey, uh, see if they could come to Toronto and do that from the CN Tower. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. What, uh, what time is it there? It's one hour earlier than in Toronto. So, you'll usher in the year 2000 an hour ahead of me. Yeah, I'll probably be in bed by the time the new year arrives in your location. Well, at least on my way home. So, please, record everything you can. We'll air your stories when you come home. I already interviewed a shaman about tonight's events, and I think it'd be interesting to listen to. Although, it's a little grim. Hey, we like Grimm. Can you play it? We have a few minutes to fill. All right, here it goes. Um... Hola, Toonie Radio listeners. This is Roxy Gibson reporting from Mexico. I'm on the Pyramid of the Moon in the ancient city of Teotihuacan, where many indigenous shamans and dancers prepare for the ceremonies and rituals for tonight. December 31st, 1999. <sighs> okay, <laughs> I made it to the top. The view from here of the whole complex and the valley is just fantastic. Lovely mountains all around and a huge pyramid in front of us that looks like another mountain, the Pyramid of the Sun. It's the third largest pyramid in the world. Oh, hi. Sorry to interrupt your music, sir. <laughs> no problem. I'm practicing for tonight. The beat also helps me to meditate. What kind of drum is that? Oh, uh, well, what? I play Hispanic instrument for ceremonies. Are you a shaman? Yes. I'm also a history teacher. My name is Eligio Melgar. Eligio. Nice meeting you. I'm Roxy, and I have a radio show in Canada. You can get it here in Mexico in shortwave. Could I interview you? Uh, it would be a pleasure, miss. <laughs> Thanks. You were saying that the Pyramid of the Sun is the third largest in the world? Yes. After the Pyramid of Cholula, also here in Mexico, but buried beneath the church, and the Pyramid of Cheops in Egypt, proudly our Pyramid of the Sun is the most powerful of them all. How is it so powerful? The Aztecs call this sacred site the birthplace of the gods and base their whole cosmogony on what already existed here. Even the Maya were influenced by the Teotihuacan culture and view of the cosmos. This site is truly the birthplace of Mesoamerican mythology and beliefs. Just by being here, you can feel this is a special energy. Hmm, true. I can attest that I've never felt energy like here. I had the most awesome meditation earlier today. Oh, anyway, let me say, your English is quite good. Thanks. I have lived in Texas for over 20 years and been a high school teacher for the last 10. Did you come back to Mexico to receive the new millennium? Oh, yes. It is important being here. The year 2000 will be a definitive moment in human history. How so? The Aztec calendar marks the chronology of every era for humankind. 
including very precise dates. Just before the Europeans arrived here and conquered everything, we were living the fifth era called the fifth sun, which is the final era marked in the Aztec calendar. So it ended about 500 years ago? No, it hasn't ended yet, but it will soon, very soon. You wouldn't mean tonight, right? Not exactly, but potentially tomorrow marks the beginning of the end of this era. Are you talking about the apocalypse? Do you have a precise date for that? I do. I was able to calculate the exact date called Nawiyojin, which means for movement. That's when the Aztec calendar ends. In other words, the date of the collapse of the fifth sun. I did this for academic reasons, not to uh, scare anyone or to become a Mexican Nostradamus. Well, you can't leave me or my listeners hanging about this date. <laughs> if it's before April, maybe we won't need to worry about our tax returns. <laughs> All right. I calculated the date as November 6th, 2000. However, if there is a real apocalypse happening, it wouldn't be a sovereign thing. It would start happening as soon as we get the first rays of sunshine of the year 2000. So according to this prediction or whatever it is, what will happen on November 7th? A new era would begin, the sixth sun. Not even in Mexico can a girl get away from apocalyptical doom. <laughs> anyway, how are we doing with time? It's close to 11.30. Oh, you know what that means. That's when the new millennium reaches North America. Yes, dear listeners, for some reason, Newfoundland is half an hour ahead of the rest of Eastern Canada. And guess what? We have a special envoy over there. Our pal Nando Castello is in St. John's at the Countdown Millennium Concert. I know, tonight we're burning up the entire budget we had saved this past century. I got Castello on the line. Awesome. Hey, Nando, how's the party on the island going? Hey, Luke, what's up? There's an incredible atmosphere here in St. John's as we're about to welcome the Millennium in Canada. Sounds like a big crowd. Labrador has never seen a party crowd like this one. About 100,000 people. It's bonkers. This is the best place to be right now in all of North America. The concert has been going non-stop since 10 p.m. Everything has been amazing so far. Any signs of the apocalypse yet? Uh, say what? I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch that. <laughs> Never mind. Where's the countdown at now? Uh, not sure. <laughs> My watch is still on Toronto time. Celebration! Celebration. 20, 20. There you go! 20 seconds left of this millennium. Any final words? The party's far from finished. We'll have a firework extravaganza in a few seconds, and the concert continues until 1 a.m. Hey, almost there! 8, 7, 6, Five, four, three, two, one. Happy New Millennium from Newfoundland and Lab. Nando, you still there? Did we lose him? Yep, gone. Ouch. Please, try to get him back on the line, Dax. Anyway, Happy New Millennium, everyone. We made it to a big bus terminal in Mexico City as we continue with this strange start to the new year. There seems to be generalized chaos here, too. <sighs> This is pretty much a normal day in Mexico City. Uh-huh. <laughs> now what, Eligio? There's already a crowd waiting for the payphones. Uh, we'll go to the telegraph office. They have phones there and it's quiet. A woman's child just fainted. Could this be related to what happened in Teotihuacan? I have no idea. Signing off. Operator, can you repeat what you just told me? At the moment, there's no long distance service in Mexico. You mean in Mexico City? No, all of Mexico. Oh, wow. How long will it take to reinstate the service? We don't know. Not today. Sorry. All right. Thanks. Thank you for using Telefonos in Mexico and have a nice day. Feliz Año 2000. <sighs> yeah. Happy Year 2000. Su telegrama va camino a destino. Gracias. Con permiso. Any luck, Eligio? No long distance, and all the airport lines are busy. Mm. Excuse me, miss. Do you know what's going on with the phones? Everything's down. What do you mean, everything? Long distance, cellular phones, UHF TV, beepers, FM radio, the airport. <sighs> El aeropuerto también. 
How do you know? They just said it on University TV. Only AM stations, some TV channels, and us are still functioning. What? Is that normal? It happened 15 years ago. Ah, el terremoto. In the aftermath of the big earthquake in 1985. Yes. Back then, Mexico lost all contact with the outside world. Oh, so awful. How long did that last? About a month. What? Okay, what time was the earthquake today? I didn't feel it. No, there was no earthquake. Then why is this happening? Nobody knows for sure, but on the radio, they were saying that computers stopped working too. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's the Y2K bug. I never believed it would actually happen. Well, I guess Mexico didn't take enough precautions. <laughs> Probably some politicians told the money man to fix the bug. Oiga, paisano. Don't jump to conclusions, hombre. I'm sure it was the hacker terrorists. The year 2000 has arrived and, as expected, brought the pestilences of the end of times. The artificial brains of computers cease to work and the pillars of the modern world are falling. Society will cease to function in a few days or weeks at the most. Humanity itself crumbles quickly. People are dropping like flies into unconsciousness. Only those who decide to awaken can seek a destiny beyond darkness. The path to clarity and light and the survival of a chosen few aims at the stars. Four months from now, on May the 5th, our solar system will experience a planetary alignment. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn will be positioned in a perfect line with the Sun. The Moon also will be lined up between the Earth and the Sun. This celestial event signals that the world we know will vanish to be replaced by a delusion that is nothing other than hell itself. In order to escape the dooming deception, the only way will be to transcend our worldly existence. The planetary alignment will serve as a once-in-a-lifetime conduit to reach the Pleiades Cluster, where a selected few can start anew. I'm Ezekiel, and I can show you the path before it's too late. Look for us, the millennial voyagers of York, at different parks around our metropolis, starting with the Toronto Zoo this Wednesday noon. The end of times has arrived, but humankind can persist and endure eternally in an astral paradise. Welcome to Toonie Radio's Y2K Nightly Show, live from Toronto to the world. The pre-recorded statement you just heard from the so-called Millennial Voyagers of York was delivered to our studios this afternoon. And after much debate, we decided to play it on air to let you, our dear audience, know all available information, which at the moment is very little. We do not condone or sponsor this group or its message, and we'll discuss about it in a few minutes. I'm Luke Marlowe, joined this Monday night by my co-host, Monique Toussaint. Such a pleasure to share this space with you, Monique. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm happy to be here. So many of our colleagues in every type of media have not been able the last couple of days to communicate with their audiences normally, so it's an honor, a privilege, and a great responsibility to still be able to reach you tonight. So what do you make of this guy Ezekiel and his York Millennials, eh? I would love the opportunity to interview them. From what we heard in their press release, or manifesto, it would seem that they're an apocalyptic cult, and it worries me what Ezekiel says about leaving this worldly existence behind. Sounds like an invitation to mass suicide. Well, for sure, that would be the wrong measure against whatever is happening. By the way, regarding this phenomenon of people falling asleep since Friday night, you taped something earlier today. Yes. I went this afternoon to Toronto's 911 command and talked to Janet Mulveen, the emergency management officer. Daksh, please play the tape. Playing. 911, what is your emergency? Hello, it's my wife. She's been sleeping for 17 hours straight. I can't wake her up. I don't know what to do. Have you made sure she's still breathing? Well, yes, she's just sleeping, but I'm concerned that she took pills or something because this isn't normal. I even threw some water on her face and nothing. Please, send someone to check her up. Sir, our first responders are all busy at the moment and there is a wait list. The earliest I could get paramedics to your address is in about five hours. 
Do you want to wait, or would you be able to take your wife to an emergency room on your own? Five hours? No, I can't wait that long. Okay, I'll drive her myself. I guess we don't pay enough taxes. 911, thank you for holding. What is your emergency? I just witnessed an accident. It didn't seem too bad, but the cyclist is unconscious. Do you have any visual contact with the victim right now? No, I'm calling from a payphone two blocks away. Mobiles are not working. What's going on? I've heard that many people are going to sleep and not waking up. Is it true? Is it a virus? Are we safe? I have no information, ma'am. The only way I can assist you is to send someone to the scene of the accident. You said it was a cyclist. Was anyone else involved? No, just a cyclist on Dufferin and Ken. Calls such as these keep coming incessantly at the Toronto 911 Command, which is the reason why we came here to interview Officer Janet Mulveen of Emergency Management. Hello, Monique, and hello again to all the listeners of Toonie Radio. How are you and everyone else here? We're exhausted, but doing our best to serve the people of Toronto. It's been a very hectic first few days of the year 2000. It has been very tough for us at emergency services to keep up with the demand for first responders' attention and the flow of patients into the city's hospital network. Can we talk about the death toll? There has been a number of accidents, transit, household, and workplace, with a confirmed death toll as of now of 14 people. Every death is tragic, but these numbers for a city the size of Toronto should not be cause of alarm. How about the number of hospital admissions since the new year? That's been the puzzling challenge we've faced since Friday night. Our hospitals have admitted an unprecedented number of patients, about 400 thus far. Do they share common symptoms? Yes, most of them seem to be in some sort of coma. Has any of these coma patients died? I know of only a couple of confirmed deaths, and they seem to be by natural causes. What are the causes of this coma condition? We have no idea. As I said, it's been really puzzling. We've been interviewing family members, friends, and witnesses to figure out any connection between all these patients. It could be alcohol or food poisoning or a new street drug. And of course, although it seems unlikely, we cannot discard the possibility of bacterial or viral infection. Wouldn't that be an epidemic? Yes, if that were the case, we'd have an unprecedented epidemic on our hands. Such a virus would spread on a scale we've never seen in Toronto, comparable only to the Hong Kong flu of 30 years ago, or the much worse Spanish flu of 80 years ago. Thanks for watching. You can now listen to the full episodes on y2kredux.com and soon on every major podcast provider. This is a Pilgrim Falcon production. Stay safe, people.